Welcome back, boss. Let's continue with this, the third chapter in What Even Happens in MGSV. In the last section of the game, we move from Chapter 1, Revenge, to Chapter 2, Race. Code Talker provides Diamond Dogs with a method of neutralizing the epidemic, and a method of learning where Skullface and Metal Gear Sahelanthropus can be found. But if the war on Skullface is the revolution, Chapter 2 depicts the post-revolutionary regime, where Big Boss becomes his own big brother in more ways than one. Along the way, Quiet disappears, Huey is exiled, the Ghost of Paws is laid to rest, huge numbers of Diamond Dogs are sacrificed, and Venom Snake finally remembers who he really is. So let's dive in. Before I begin though, let me say this. What's important to keep in mind is that everything that happens in the Phantom Pain is merely a record of events, as encoded in Venom Snake's memories. Much like Ishmael's relaying of the tale of Moby Dick in Melville's novel, events to come in the Phantom Pain can color how events are relayed to us in the present of the past, if that makes sense. Also keep in mind one of the neo-totalitarian mottos from George Orwell's 1984, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. So first, let's close out Chapter 1, Revenge, starting with Mission 28, Code Talker. At long last, we track the mysterious old man to a villa hidden in the massive forest region along the Angola Zaire border. We're told Code Talker's been kept here in secret by making the place look abandoned, and by spreading rumors that it's haunted. It's been bought by the Zairean government, just like Nagumba Industrial Zone had. However, apparently now Code Talker's guards, CRS, know that word of Code Talker's presence there has gotten out, and so are no longer in hiding. I'm guessing they kept Code Talker hidden by making the place look empty. But now the word's out that he's there. There's no need to be discreet. So their security finally gets to flex its muscles. The Intel team member from Root Cause tells us exactly where to find Code Talker, as I mentioned. We show up expecting a heavy presence of guards, only to find the outskirts of the forest abandoned. Suddenly, a new unit we've never seen before of the Skulls show up, the Camo Unit. Their resemblance with Quiet is a bit of foreshadowing as to her origins. We can fight them or flee. After crossing the Haunted Forest, which is eerily similar to Sakravano, where in MGS3 we battled the End, we come across Kotaker's mansion. Though we've been told to expect a guard detail who know we're coming, Kotaker doesn't seem all that well defended. He's just being held in a locked room in a basement wine cellar, with caskets dated as far back as 1932. Grand plans like fine wine age well with time. Code Talker tells us outright we've kept him waiting. He has Snake draw from a kind of peace pipe to apparently deafen any parasites that may be dormant in Snake's vocal cords or lungs. Then Code Talker explains the basics about the parasites and says that he knows of a way to halt the onset of symptoms. As soon as you try to exfiltrate with Code Talker, those ZRS soldiers become zombies. The guards are acting strange, almost puppet-like. It could be the skulls. If you didn't already take them down, this is accompanied by yet another attack by the camo unit of the skulls. Then you get attacked in midair by a cloud of corrosive metallic archaea, a microbe that Code Talker cultivated that corrodes metal. This downs your chopper, bringing back traumatic memories of nine years ago, and forces you to fight the armor unit of the Skulls, which you first encountered during Traitor's Caravan. But curiously, unlike how the Mist unit attacked Miller the instant that you left him alone back in Phantom Limbs,
neither camo nor armor units of the Skulls ever try to harm Code Talker. They don't seem interested in him at all. After you beat the Skulls, Ocelot shows up in a backup chopper, and safely aboard, Code Talker explains Skullface's plans. He plans to use Enrichment Archaea to saturate the world with nuclear weapons and bring the superpowers to their knees by returning to the atmosphere of the height of the Cold War. Except this time, any small group of militants will be able to get their hands on nuclear weapons. Not to mention platforms to launch them in the form of Walker Gears. You return to Mother Base and Code Talker reveals his treatment for parasites is ironically yet another parasite, specifically Walbachia, which turn male vocal cord parasites female, preventing reproduction in these monogamous pairs. But as a result of this treatment, the sperm of inoculated male Diamond Dog staff members, due to cytoplasmic incompatibility triggered by the treatment, will kill any egg on contact. The Diamond Dogs, in other words, have been sterilized. Even worse, this sets the stage for the much later episode, Shining Lights Even in Death. But that, of course, won't be for a while. Skullface has used the Enrichment Archaea to build Sahalanthropus' armor out of depleted uranium, which can rapidly be enriched and then detonate, transforming the Metal Gear into one big suicide bomber. Archaea are also crucial, by the way, to the functioning of Emric's exo legs. Code Talker is the linchpin, it seems, of nearly all of the technology that we've been seeing throughout the game. So what's his story? Well, it's a rather long one, given he's over 100 years old. But generally, Code Talker is a parasitologist who used to work for Cypher before being essentially blackmailed into providing Skullface with his talents. Now that Skullface's plans are complete, Code Talker, it seems, is free to go. I'll be back soon. I've set up shop, not far from here. We'll be seeing a lot more of each other. If you're close by, then it is almost complete. We're in the final phases. All that's left is to see if I can actually disable a nuke, with the help of your metallic Archaea. Once that's done, I won't have to return here again, and your suffering will end, as will your people's. We're almost finished, Code Talker. Each in our own way. Skullface is no longer in Africa. The nuclear test was a success. Now they turned the knives on me. Satellites didn't read any test. Neither did seismometers. The final test was the opposite. To prevent detonation. You mean? Skullface plans to sell nuclear weapons that he retains control of. Now we're told that Skullface is in Afghanistan again because Sahelanthropus is complete. Supposedly this is the big moment where he intends to reveal its existence to the entire world. Ocelot takes some of Code Talker's corrosive Archaea and uses it to torture Huey, Emmerich. Back during episode 11, Hellbound, we extracted the former MSF engineer to interrogate Huey about colluding with Cypher's strike force, XOF. Since becoming Diamond Dog's prisoner, Huey's provided us with not one but two Metal Gears, Walker Gear and Battle Gear. But it turns out he's been holding back intel on Sahalanthropus, intel he only divulges now once Ocelot makes his worst nightmare seem on the verge of becoming a reality. Rather than suffer the unbearable pain of the Archaea eating through his bolt perforated leg bones, Huey spills the beans. Skullfaces continued developing Sahalanthropus all this time, inside a secret design bureau given the dubious codename OKB0. As always in Skullface's case, it's a front. It's here in OKB0, a mysterious fortress ruin dating all the way back, we're told, to historic conquerors like Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great. That chapter 1 reaches its climax in episode 30, Skullface. But after the considerable effort it takes to reach the heliport, with all of Diamond Dogs providing you support in a second chopper, instead of some big standard MGS style boss fight, Skullface uses words to overpower you completely. 
Kaz encourages this voluntary divulgence, insisting that Diamond Dogs have the true upper hand, but Skullface dominates you with his presence, as Snake and he take on the appearance of student and master. After Skullface explains his full rationale and divulges his true plan is ultimately about exterminating the English language, your road trip ends back in the cave that we first visited in Hellbound behind Serac Power Plant. It's here that Skullface seems to summon the man on fire in order to kill you in front of XOF. But right in the nick of time, somehow, that mysterious floating boy with psychic powers syncs up with the stowaway and Diamond Dog's other chopper, Eli. Eli's desire to get revenge on you totally throws off Skullface's plans, as suddenly Metal Gear Sahelanthropus becomes Eli's plaything. Putting this threat to bed is your primary objective in the final mission for Chapter 1, Sahelanthropus. Is Skullface trying to wipe out English or every language besides English? We're told both at different times. How do we explain this paradox? He calls them his ethnic cleansers. Ethnic cleansers? That's what Skullface is after. Then Pinzoya Badiabulo was... Boss, he's gonna wipe every language besides English off the face of the earth. An English strain of the vocal parasite. I will exterminate the English language. With this, I'll rid the world of infestation. All men will breathe free again. Reclaim their past, present, and future. This is no ethnic cleanser. It is a liberator. To free the world from zero. One of his three English strains is in quiet, which means he's had it ready since at least episode 11. Skullface massacres scores of Soviets with a Russian strain of the parasite. Their bodies are visibly burning all around us as Skullface delivers his speech. If you'll notice, XOF here have occupied not only OKB0, but this entire region. spread reports of a chemical weapon leak. The infection won't spread into the surrounding regions. Still, I think they just exterminate the men who work for them all this time. Skullface must be making his final play. So what's the deal? Which is it? Well, it seems that Skullface has a three-stage plan in mind, as far as I can tell. Stage one, use the non-English strains to hasten the spread of English, since it will be the only safe lingua franca left. Stage 2, exterminate English, depriving the new one society world of its skeleton, its common tongue. Stage 3, replace English with Archaea enriching nukes and their new platforms, Metal Gears. Bereft of everything but the lingua franca of revenge, the world in Skullface's master plan will become one. Will link lost arms and join together in a phantom pain. This war, as he tells us soon, is peace. So in this regard, Code Talker is only a third correct about Skullface's master plan. Now there's the matter of Sahelanthropus. This Metal Gear only works thanks to the paranormal abilities of the third boy, just like the man on fire. The third boy and the man on fire both seem to be research subjects that manifest Skullface's lingua franca of revenge. The third boy, who will become the character from MGS1 Psychomantis, acts as a kind of parapsychological conduit for intensely negative emotions, words from foreign minds, which invade, burrow, and nest inside him like parasites. The man on fire, meanwhile, seems to use this power as a proxy to fuel his own limitless lust for revenge against Big Boss for the events of MGS3. The mindless rage that consumes him seems in turn to directly foreshadow the kind of emotional control that we see of the Beauty and Beast unit in MGS4. Skullface incorrectly assumes that no one in the world could have a stronger lust for revenge than himself. 
Children like, say, Eli have emotions with a strange effect on the surrounding magnetic field due to their myelin sheaths being underdeveloped. This allows Eli to hijack Sahelanthropus using the third boy at this key moment and ruin Skullface's plans. The strain that Venom Snake thinks he throws into the fire is recaptured by the third boy. Now, after fighting Sahelanthropus and reclaiming it as a sign of the mark that Diamond Dogs wish to leave on the world, Chapter 1, Revenge comes to a close, and Chapter 2, Race, begins. It begins with a rather totalitarian-seeming speech by Kaz. Attention! Diamond Dogs! Even with Skullface dead, our brothers are unavenged, and the phantom pain he brought us lives on. It seems as though Mother Base is rapidly descending into a miniature police state, with posters adorning nearly every corridor that say Big Boss is watching you. A nod, of course, to Orwell's 1984, and the posters found in that world that said Big Brother is watching you. Next comes the episode 32 to know too much. In this episode, a spy who worked for Langley inside the Soviet Union has learned about XOF using the Russian strain of vocal cord parasites, and now he wants to rejoin the Red Army for real. Diamond Dogs don't want either Langley or the Kremlin to learn about the parasites, but neither, it seems, do the remnants of XOF, still active after Skullface's death, who try to kill the target. Someone has taken over the observation post north of Lamar Hate Palace, and a vehicle has just left the post, headed for the palace. Watch yourself. This could be connected to the target. If he's with the group that took over the north observation post, he can't be a Soviet. The only thing that comes to mind is... remnants of XOF. Wait, could they be out to silence the target? Now if you rush through this, you can get the target extracted and exfil before really seeing the substance of this episode. For that, you have to allow the rescue target to get captured and wait a while. The point of To Know Too Much seems to be establishing that, as I said, XOF are still operating without Skullface, and now take their orders from Cypher. The fact that Cypher and Skullface both use the same channels to issue their orders is evidence for my theory about a cold civil war within the organization. Skullface was wielding the power of Cypher, yet at the same time fighting Cypher, too, not unlike how parasites attack their hosts. We'll keep him here as originally planned. Those men hunting for the target were Soviet troops who were colluding with the XOF. After securing the North Observation Post and learning the target's location, XOF sent assassins to eliminate him. Skullface had turned XOF into his personal army, but the organization continues to exist even after his death. According to the man you extracted, their orders came through the same channel as always. But is Zero really able to give orders in his current state? Or is somebody else calling the shots for XOF? For Cypher? What the hell? The one thing to know too much brings up but never addresses is the possibility the target's been exposed to the Russian strain. Could that, and not knowing too much at all, be why XOF are trying to kill him? Or for that matter, why Diamond Dogs is so interested in getting him for themselves? Perhaps to study. Guilt and horror are starting to rise to the forefront for both what's already happened back in 1975 to Chico, Paz, and Mother Base, and for what's to come for the child soldiers, Diamond Dogs, and Venom Snake himself. The line in this mission about the agent's guilt over his leaks sending comrades to their deaths seems to be directly foreshadowing shining lights even in death. Now, a lot of Chapter 2 involves side ops and replays of previous missions with new requirements and features. But as for completely new missions, next comes Curse Legacy. In this episode, you have to recover research that Code Talker has been assembling since the Second World War. Just like the last mission, we're told that with Skullface dead, our enemy is once again Major Zero, that he's trying to get his hands on Code Talker's life's work, which would give Cypher knowledge of the ethnic cleanser parasites. Boss, research materials have been stolen from Code Talker's mansion. 
The pickup crew coming for those documents is none other than XOF. That's right. They're still active, even after Skullface's death. Now that he's no longer in charge, their original chain of command has been restored. Meaning if XOF gets those documents, Code Talker's research ends up in Cypher's hands. According to Code Talker, the research papers stored in that mansion account for over 50 years of study. The problem is the vocal cord parasites. If the papers documenting that research fall into Cypher's hands, they'll take another long, hard look at them. The ethnic cleansers we thought were history will become a reality. America, Zero, will have a weapon far more powerful than any nuke. Even worse, if this knowledge were to leak, the world, humanity, can't be entrusted with this kind of power. I theorize that by joining Diamond Dogs, in reality, Code Talker may simply just be rejoining the power behind Diamond Dogs, the power that he's worked for his entire life, Cypher. But more on this soon. It seems transparently true to me that this mission is really about the opposite of what you're told, recovering that research as an unwitting member of Cypher so they can continue it in secret. A chopper does arrive, but we aren't given a good look at it. And what's very crucial here is to remember this blood red eye that we can see in a picture of Code Talker's research. Because as we'll see, it resembles the effects that will later be apparent from a mutated strain of the parasite during Shining Lights. One of the reasons that I suspect Code Talker continues to work for Cypher is that a lot of his creations seem to directly resemble technology that we'll see in later games from the Patriots like the Solid Eye in MGS4, which looks like the monocular device used by the camo unit here, or the Skull Suit that'll be used by Raiden in MGS2. Next comes the episode Extraordinary. One of Diamond Dog's informants has been killed trying to get you intel on the third boy and the man on fire. He only had time to put it in a film canister that he hid in Spook May Keep and begin transmitting a photo of the location before the source was killed and the data upload interrupted. As a squad of Spetsnaz sweep the area, it's a race against time to get to the canister before they find and destroy it. The thing about Extraordinary is, one, it's a mission helmed by Ocelot, the first one since Phantom Limbs. Ocelot brings up that mission explicitly, and you're encouraged to think back to when you first started the game. And two, the scenario of the mission plays out a bit like torture, which we know Ocelot loves. It's almost comically agonizing trying to find the film canister while Spetsnaz just keeps showing up. The film canister detail, and it not being a cassette tape, feels also like it's subtly conjuring up the phantoms of Operation Snake Eater. And finally, the specifics of how the Intel team agent was interrupted while reporting in is a definite nod to the start of the original Metal Gear. The mission, in other words, where Venom Snake will be killed. I think there's some connection between the third boy, the man on fire, and Venom Snake. Getting intel on the first two, after all, is what this mission's all about. It's almost as though the awakening of the man on fire and Venom Snake are linked. In fact, the report we recover here expressly tells us as much. But there are contradictions, as far as I can tell, in Ocelot's account of the intel. Contradictions that seem to hint towards Ocelot continuing, as he did during our nine years on ice, to implant suggestions in our unconscious, words to control us from the inside. The big case in point is revenge. In the Intel report, Ocelot claims that when Venom Snake woke up, his mind was full of such a lust for revenge that it kick-started the third boy's powers, hundreds of miles away. This supposedly explains the huge plane crash that starts the game in the northern Ukraine from off-screen. Afterwards, supposedly the third boy got moved by the Soviets to a secret research lab outside Moscow where they happened to also be keeping Volgin to study his brain-dead body. It was supposedly then that the two became a pair, burning down the facility in a nod to how Gray Fox and Naomi will kill Dr. Clark in MGS1 before heading straight to Big Boss's location in Cyprus. Yet in the same report, Ocelot also says that the third boy's powers have a reception radius of only roughly three miles. So how did Venom Snake's awakening trigger anything in him hundreds of miles away? I think Ocelot is using the third boy and the man on fire as more symbols than anything else, words to control Venom Snake's subconscious. 
because Leighton, in Ocelot's words, is the subtle revelation that Venom Snake has himself been turned into a living weapon with no will of his own, and no emotion left to feel but the desire to get revenge. They were used as tools of the Cold War. The boy's only crime was being born with unique gifts. But he was sacrificed on the altar of war. His life reduced to slavery under other people's wills. Turned into a living weapon with no will of his own. And eventually the only emotion he could feel must have been the desire to get revenge for the hand he'd been dealt. Boss, it's you that awaken the boy's powers. But there's more to it than that. I guess the anger emanating from you was something he could truly relate to. The last we'll ever see of Venom Snake, he'll be smashing his own reflection out in a vengeful rage. It was always part of the plan for Venom Snake to learn he isn't the real big boss and would want revenge for being used. In light of all this, the discrepancies in the reports that you get from this mission seem to make a little more sense. Proxy War Without End takes us back to Central Africa. This mission somewhat combines two previous ones back in Afghanistan, Back Up, Back Down, and Red Brass. Except while in those missions we were working for the West, in Proxy War Without End we work for the East. Much of Chapter 2 is about using gameplay to convey the evolution of war in the Metal Gear Solid universe into something mundane and repetitive, as just another industry, another part of the global capitalist economy. Ironically, this mission helps convey that even communist and socialist regimes have become assimilated into this new world order, as they too have to pay good money to mercenary groups to fight their battles for them in secret. Another key element to this mission happens when you interrogate the Armored Column's commander. He recognizes you as Big Boss and can't wait to join Diamond Dogs. Your legend is now firmly established, your identity as the real Big Boss unquestioned. That's why you're no longer particularly useful to Cypher, perhaps. As you carry out these missions, something starts happening with the child soldiers. Eli kills a fellow inmate named Ralph, using the third boy to crush him using steel pipes, making it look like an accident. Eli uses his ruse to convince six other child soldiers to leave Mother Base. Once you re-extract all six, Eli, maybe under Ocelot's subtle influence and empowered by the third boy, now considers himself a commander of his own rebellion. This uprising seizes the Holanthropus and decamps to an island in the middle of a salt lake in Central Africa. This won't get resolved except as a Phantom episode, 51, Kingdom of the Flies. A detailed analysis of episode 51 will have to wait, because there's just so much that happens there. There's also a lot to argue about, specifically over whether it was or wasn't really an unfinished episode. Personally, I suspect it was intentionally presented as incomplete for thematic reasons that I won't get into now. All I'll say here is that the Tower of Babel, too, was incomplete. At any rate, in the Phantom Pain itself, Eli leaves and that's pretty much the last that we see of him. What follows, though, is that we learn the kids had help from Huey, who answered questions they had about getting Sahelanthropus operational again. And then soon after follows episode 43, Shining Lights Even in Death. But first we need context, and for that we'll need to talk about Code Talker's so-called inoculation of the Kikongo strain. Code Talker's modified Wolbachia halted the monogamous pairs of vocal cord parasites mating by turning males to females, which I mentioned. These were cultivated using corpses of victims of the parasite at Mother Base, which still festered with larvae. This sex-changing ability that the Wolbachia have evolved with, they gained as an adaptation suited for populations of polyamorous organisms. The sex change occurs because sperm lacks the very cellular component that Wolbachia nest inside, namely cytoplasm. That means that in polyamorous groups, where one male can reproduce with multiple females, the less males that are present, the more Wolbachia can spread. Code Talker modifies them to attack the monogamous vocal cord parasites, rendering, ironically, the host of the pathogen and the pathogen, which is, in turn, the host to the Wolbachia, both sterile. 
Even if a Diamond Dog member got infected, inside their body the parasite hairs could not reproduce, thanks to the Wolbachia. But all that changes with Shining Lights. A radiation leak, we're told, has caused the Wolbachia within the dormant vocal cord parasites to mutate. These mutated Wolbachia, in turn, triggered a similar evolution in their hosts, the parasites, which points to the presence of a strong mutagen, something we'll discuss soon. Now a new, all-female strain has come about, one that reproduces by cloning itself without the need for males at all, a process known as parthenogenesis. And it no longer triggers reproduction upon detecting a certain language over time. It reproduces and feasts on the lungs almost instantly. This outbreak has occurred in a secret research lab inside the quarantine platform that Kaz only tells us about once there's a radiation leak there. The radiation leak we'll find that starts this new outbreak. Hang on, Snake. We've just had a transmission from inside. Here's the audio. Where's it coming from? Unknown. It cut off before we could get a fix. It all makes sense. Think he means the parasite? No way to know. But right now, that's all we've got. Hopefully he can tell us something. But it's unclear whether the speaker is a researcher who's truly tracked down the answers you seek, or if truth and its victory as states of mind are actually symptoms of this disease. Like back during episode 32, we get a little allusion to the events of Operation Intrude in 313, when Foxhound operative Gray Fox will send an interrupted message only containing the words Metal Gear. The air above us is full of ravens, something we won't understand until later in the mission. Snake enters the facility into a hallway we've seen before. It's the same one we think we see outside Paz's hospital room and both hallways are thick with some sort of smoke or heavy air. But more on pause later. Life's end, isn't it beautiful? It's almost tragic. When life ends, it gives off a final lingering aroma. Light is but a farewell gift from the darkness to those on their way to die. Next, there's a nod to something that Joy says at the end of MGS3, as Snake smells through his mask the lingering aroma of life's end, and it smells sweet. We find hallways drenched in blood, now a reference to the bloody hallways of MGS1 and 2. The researchers inside have clearly turned on each other in a kind of secret mini-civil war. Moving through the hellscape of blood and tragedy, you come upon a locked room. Entering it, Snake finds the message's source. The researcher, wearing night vision goggles and suffering from a stab wound, makes bizarre cryptic remarks about how he's not a snail. This is a clue about the parthenogenesis. His eyes, note, are bloodshot, just like that picture we saw included in Code Talker's research back after episode 35. Remember also that when we first met Code Talker, his jacket made him resemble nothing more than a vulture, a bird that feeds on the dead. Speaking of birds, this new pathogen emits that sweet smell to attract birds, which is why these ravens have flocked to Mother Base. If they eat the infected's flesh, the pathogen will spread around the world, over the air. Miller has to fire strike the roof, where more of the infected swarm towards the light that the disease makes irresistible to them, then you can stop at once. What this means is that unlike the vocal cord parasites, as far as we can tell, this mutated strain actually impacts the host's thoughts. Using the goggles to detect the heat signature of the disease once it becomes symptomatic by giving off a telltale fever in the throat, you now have to massacre down your own men as Huey Emmerich loudly protests. There's a particularly haunting moment where in the basement you come across men who are buzzily humming the MGS theme in a terrible noise that almost sounds like insects. Strangely, they're humming and buzzing along with a tape. An ominous bit of foreshadowing, perhaps. We see for ourselves just how fast this mutated pathogen works on a host at the end when we very nearly take a sick survivor out of quarantine, 
The symptoms weren't showing when we came upon him, but within minutes, they've already activated. What happens next seems to be a hallucination, as Snake imagines himself walking back down the hallway, removing his mask and falling to his knees. Notice that it seems the only reason Snake had to shoot his men himself, apart from the fact that getting shot is more humane than being burned alive, may have been to keep the research facility standing. Snake stops the men from dumping the ashes at sea, almost dumps them himself, but then decides to adorn and anoint himself with their remains. He orders diamonds to be fashioned out of their ashes as shining lights bright even in death. The way the mutated parasites altered their host's cognition echoes how the nanomachines in MGS4 will control their hosts from the inside. But we're humans. Surely our minds are too complex for that. Shit! muttering the same things over and over about the pathogen. I thought just the same. Free will is what makes us human, so it never occurred to me that the parasites could be controlling the symptomatic. But the mood, the will of a person can be easily affected by the balance of their cerebral substances. But to think that mutations occurred in both the Walbachia and its parasite hosts, your observation is most apt. Both mutations occurring at once indicates the presence of a powerful mutagen. Whatever the truth behind this second outbreak, Code Talker and Diamond Dogs claim the fact both the Walbachia and the vocal cord parasite mutated together points to the presence of a powerful mutagen namely the radiation leak that I mentioned earlier. And this brings us to the likeliest culprit, Huey Emmerich. Eli's insurrection, as I mentioned, got Huey's input in order to get Sahelanthropus working again, and apparently Huey's been in contact with Cypher all along, something foreshadowed in an early tape when he mentions a certain Dr. Clark, a biotech firm, ATGC, and cloning. Code Talker is overheard telling Skullface in a tape that radiation is another method of halting the onset of parasite symptoms. No. Uh. Radiation. It's radiation. Radiation, of course. So it can be used. But how much, I do not know. The research team in the quarantine facility were using x-ray equipment to monitor the vocal cord parasites latent in their throats. No problem there, they kept a close eye on the radiation doses. But that equipment didn't just give off x-rays. It was also emitting beta rays. Even though that's unnecessary for the scans. See, beta rays have far worse effects on DNA than x-rays meaning the only logical conclusion is that someone added in a beta ray emitter to trigger a mutation. Those beta rays leaked out from inside the equipment. Because the emitter was retrofitted, the shielding was inadequate. And the person who ordered and inspected the equipment was you, doctor. Ocelot and Cause accuse Huey of intentionally retrofitting this X-ray equipment with a beta emitter as a secret experiment to test the effects of the treatment method that Code Talker mentioned in the tape, exposing, in other words, the parasite to radiation, even though Code Talker does say in the tape that it's a total unknown what will occur if you try this method in hosts post-infection. So now you're saying I sabotage medical equipment for some wild plan to make the vocal cord parasite kill everyone? Or maybe you thought it'd reveal a way to treat the parasite without using the Walbachia. And with that much to barter, I suppose some people would welcome even a pathetic cur like you. Just stop it! You'd have no shortage of buyers. But most would be happy with just the parasite. 
you wouldn't need to offer anything else. However, if that buyer already knew about the parasite, they'd also know that by itself, it's no longer the ultimate bargaining chip it once was. To sell to that buyer, you need to throw in a bonus, a way to one-up it. There's only one buyer who'd be after that. <laughs> Emmerich, we record all communications on Mother Base. That includes radio transmissions to and from homemade devices. You've been in frequent contact with people in America. A private biotech company. A client of which is DARPA. And they are connected to Cypher. You made a deal with Cypher. You offered them a new parasite in exchange for your safety. This is the only place in the world where the vocal cord parasite still exists. And you used it as a testing ground. Tried to resurrect their bioweapon. But your plan to obtain the parasite has failed. Your bullshit ends now. What Ocelot and Kaz say in questioning Huey 5 somewhat contradict. Ocelot alleges that Huey intended to test if radiation could treat the parasite without using Wolbachia. Yet, Kaz says Huey was trying to resurrect Cypher's pathogen. Well, which is it? It's the difference between something like involuntary manslaughter and first-degree murder. Either the new strain was an unintended outcome or the primary objective. It can't be both. Then there's also other problems with Ocelot's allegations. If the parasites were already sterile in the researchers' throats, how would the sterilizing effects of beta radiation be testable at all? Finally, there's this crucial conversation between Kaz and Code Talker during the actual mission. Miller, when you learned of the radiation leak, why did you evacuate the researchers in the research block to the containment block rather than outside? We are lucky to seal the parasites inside. But I can't help but think. It's because I suspected it was sabotage. That one of the researchers was responsible for the leak. So that is why you moved them somewhere still under construction. And sent in an armed security force. And when they went missing, he sent in a MOP-3 rescue team, meaning one fitted with American anti-WMD gear. With more Wolbachia, which inadvertently catalyzed a much worse outbreak. Miller's excuse for moving the researchers to the containment block still under development was that his first thought was blaming the researchers themselves. He suspected a cipher saboteur among their ranks, so he ordered for them to be detained in the unfinished corridor. That suspicion in turn infected the security team, first turning them against the research team and then on each other. When the third group appeared, they found themselves walking right into the middle of a mini civil war. So who caused the leak? Who installed the beta emitter? If Kaz immediately suspected foul play, why didn't he say so? Side ops list updated. I have a quick report for you here. We've discovered a radiation leak in the laboratory on the quarantine platform. It's coming from testing equipment we installed the other day. Members of the medical team have been conducting research there, but we'll evacuate them all from the research block to the containment block next to it. Emmerich. There's no need to worry. No radioactive material is leaked, so the contamination won't spread. We just need to seal off the testing equipment. I've dispatched the security team to get the researchers out. I'll keep you updated. Why didn't he mention suspecting the researchers? And why did he apparently force Huey to say that no radioactive material leaked? Well, I think it's in moments like these that MGSV takes on the features of investigative fiction not unlike Kojima's two early non-MGS games, Snatcher and Police Knots. Except whereas those games both had definite answers to their criminal conspiracies, MGSV is more about the procedure of law and order than the actual facts of the crime. It's more like the real world, where you don't always see the truth come out in a clear-cut and dry way. I cannot tell you everything that we know, but what I can share with you when combined with what all of us have learned over the years is deeply troubling. What you will see is an accumulation of facts and disturbing patterns of behavior. The facts in Iraqi's behavior, Iraq's behavior demonstrate that Saddam Hussein and his regime have made no effort, no effort 
to disarm as required by the international community. Indeed, the facts and Iraq's behavior show that Saddam Hussein and his regime are concealing their efforts to produce more weapons of mass destruction. Let me begin by playing a tape for you. Let's return for a second, actually, to Skullface's speech. He implies that yes, Code Talker was free to go when you rescued him, and that yes, Code Talker has rejoined the fold with Cypher. Whatever the Navajo told you, it's just one possible solution derived by Cypher. My will is different. He outlines some of what's really been going on behind the scenes, or at least provides some hints. After Big Boss and his old commanding officer Major Zero had a falling out over Zero cloning Snake back in 1972, Zero could no longer depend on a single person to unite the world the way he had intended. So instead of Big Boss, Cypher has decided to build a global system of mind control to fulfill a twisted interpretation of the boss's will. There are three rival interpretations in the game on how to best accomplish the boss's dying wish of uniting the world. For Zero, it is by automating conformity and creating peace by using information technology and genetics. For Skullface, however, it is by making the world one through putting everyone on Earth through the same trauma, loss, bound together by the chain of retaliation. It is because Big Boss has known loss and become a demon, as Skullface calls him, that the two can speak as equals here. The third rival interpretation of the boss's will is that of the real Big Boss which seeks to unite all the warfighters of the planet into a single brotherhood, a new nation, outer heaven. The Zero and Big Boss factions seem to form a temporary alliance in this cold civil war to defeat Skullface, not unlike, perhaps, how the US and Soviet Union fought together to fight the Nazis in World War II, or the US and the Mujahideen against the Soviets in turn in the Afghan war. And once Skullface dies, it seems Diamond Dogs gets sacrificed somewhat to Zero's faction to provide the real Big Boss cover while he bides his time. So you see Skullface and his chain of retaliation never goes away, not even with his death. The only complication is that I suspect it may have been Zero who ordered Skullface to strike MSF in retaliation for Big Boss's rejection of him at the end of Peace Walker. It all happens exactly as Paz warned it would. Big Boss becomes a pariah on the world stage and helps Zero, like it or not, to create his world without borders. You will become pariahs, and you will be wiped off the face of the earth. Rather than heroes, you will be seen as a well-armed extremist cult prone to indiscriminate outbursts of nuclear aggression. You will give rise to a new world order, an age of deterrence defined by its fear of extremist cult influence. I figure South Africa started getting serious about nuclear weapons production in 75. In 74, the government was still able to get by with bluffing that it had a nuclear arsenal. But the year after, word spread that an independent armed group in the Caribbean was crushed by Cypher for possessing a WMD. That's right, boss. What happened to you and your men was the reason South Africa decided to push ahead with nuclear development. A force independent of any country getting its hands on a nuke. That was a threat to the existence of countries everywhere. It wasn't just South Africa. Your presence pushed a lot of countries to get nukes. The world was scared of you. You were a threat to more than just the Cold War. If nations are gears in a machine, you have the power to smash them loose and watch the whole world grind to a halt. It's because all three factions of Cypher are so mixed up together that it becomes basically impossible to know for sure which is doing what at any given time. With all the betrayals, ruses, and spies going around, we can't trust anyone or anything. It is, in other words, the ultimate MGS experience. Ironically, the player and prosecutor Miller are in the same boat here, trying to prove this allegation or that in this game, past a certain point seems impossible. Why? Because in MGSV, the point isn't what really happened, which may in fact be unknowable to us, but rather how the authorities react. It's only because we lack concrete proof that what happens next works the way it does, serving as an indictment not of any criminal, but of what passes in our world for justice. 
Miller tells everyone on base about Huey's so-called crimes, and he and Ocelot conduct a show trial right out of Stalin's purges during the Great Terror. This event also contains an underlying nod to the scapegoating of Saddam Hussein for 9-11. Huey and Kaz use unrelated crimes with much more evidence behind them to convict Huey of something nobody ever provides a compelling enough motive to explain. Exploiting the masses and their appetite for a simple story, just like the Patriots will be doing by MGS2. They regulate the country's various interests through controlled presentation, staging a drama that is palatable to the general masses. I'm not saying Huey definitely had nothing to do with the outbreak, but I am saying that intentions aren't all there is to cause an effect. Even if Huey did install the beta emitter, that was not the only thing that contributed to this outbreak. Miller may blame Huey, yet they wouldn't have lost nearly as many men had Miller actually trusted his own people. This is similar to how he blamed Skullface for the first epidemic, even though technically Diamond Dogs infected itself. In denial, you simply resort to looking for another, more convenient truth in order to make yourself feel better. Leaving behind in an instant the so-called truth you once embraced. Prolonging the conflict to maximize profits. Be scum. Whether or not Huey is truly responsible is impossible to say, but Venom Snake decides on a punishment by banishment rather than execution. This whole ordeal seems to foreshadow Venom Snake facing his own demons, facing, in other words, that he's been lying to himself, just as Huey apparently has been lying to everyone else. One day he'll see through the lies he's built up, realize what kind of man he really is. What goes around comes around. You can't run from yourself forever. <laughs> Before that big reveal though, there's the matter of pause and quiet. Pause, it turns out, is a phantom that was implanted in Venom Snake's unconscious by Ocelot and Cypher as a sort of time bomb that's to go off at the right moment and remind him of the truth. I hope I am not the only one who looks back on those days with happiness. There is more to remember than hatred and rage. But of course, this is you thinking that I should think that. It is no mystery now. I am just a phantom. A fragment of the mind you have lost. The real me died a long time ago. But even so, more so, I can tell what you are really feeling. The real emotion that is locked away at the bottom of your heart. Let it fly out. Let it guide you. Live. I think it is my job to tell you that. That is why I exist. So this tape is the last one. Once you are done listening to it, I am one phantom limb that will be gone for good. My flesh, my bones, joining the silt on the ocean floor. But do not forget, as long as you remember me, I will always live within you. Not a phantom limb or a phantom anything. As part of your heart. I will always be your angel of peace. Quiet, meanwhile, was sent to Mother Base by Skullface, latent with the third English pair implanted after she was nearly burned alive during her failed attempt on Big Boss's life in Cyprus. The English pair are concealed in what look to be her breast implants. Quiet's lungs have been replaced by these parasites, who have no living lung tissue to subsist off and so use photosynthesis, which in turn allows Quiet symbiotically to breathe through her skin. Quiet tries to escape and reject her mission to kill Venom Snake. In order to stay here, she took a vow of eternal silence. But then, that sudden mutation showed this was not enough. As long as the parasites were inside her, she could not predict what might happen. And that's why she took off, sacrificing herself to make sure the English strain died with her? 
she's captured by vengeful Soviets, who still have a score to settle for those among their ranks that Quiet assassinated prior to coming to Mother Base. After working together to keep a battalion of Soviets at bay, Quiet has to speak English to save your life after Venom Snake is grievously poisoned by a literal Venom Snake. Quiet has to radio in and tell the Medivac their location. After that, she disappears, choosing to return to silence rather than to adopt the lingua franca forced upon her of revenge. But the words we shared, no, that was no language at all. That is why I chose the language of gratitude instead and go back to silence. I am quiet. I am the absence of words. And finally, foreshadowed over and over again, least of all by this moment when the man on fire, realizing that you aren't the real snake, finally has his flame of revenge snuffed out, comes the last mission, episode 46, The Man Who Sold the World. In it, we learn the real big boss has stolen your faith and identity, implanting you with his own like a parasite. The final sequence is of you and his phantom conversing in symbiosis in the room that we've spent recollecting the events of the game as flashbacks, it seems, all along. The game ends with literal smoke and mirrors, as Venom Snake goes on to lead Outer Heaven and eventually to be killed by Big Boss's clone, Solid Snake. Suffering proxy punishment for the sins of the man who sold the world and who may also as well be his father. The madness that Venom Snake has endured is the byproduct of mysterious hypnagogic therapy conducted over the nine years of Big Boss's coma by Ocelot, secretly as an agent of Zero, the real Big Boss, and some version of Cypher. We've been busy over the last nine years. His altered state of consciousness has helped us implant powerful suggestions through induced hypnagogia. He's experienced all your missions on record and shares all your knowledge and experience to make him believe that he is the one true Big Boss. I've prepared a ruse of sorts, one I imagine you'll quite like. What is it? You could say, I've made another snake. Major? I'm not talking about the children. A mental copy. Zero turns you into two different groups and then sets those groups to war. Much as we see throughout the war-torn regions in the Phantom Pain from Afghanistan to Angola, this was the same strategy practiced by the British Empire against its asymmetrical enemies to colonize them for a century. Bantu ya buta, tiyambele, ketinkaka mosi, beto nyoso, kebampangi, atampidina, ya ikentango, ya kufutuka diaka, ni mafe, menga, kekilo, kuluta masa, what was it all for? If the boss has some plan, what is it? The real big boss is working separately from us to create his new nation. New nation? A military nation above and apart from all. The true outer heaven. One day, the age of Big Boss's sons will arrive. They'll likely want to settle the score with him. We have to shape that age. We'll each have roles to play. Building the foundation for a revolution led by both Big Bosses, the True One and the Phantom. No. Big Boss can go to hell. I'll make the Phantom and his sons stronger to send him there. Miller only ever went along with the Venom Snake ruse to train you as the perfect training in turn for Big Boss's sons who will oppose you on their way to killing Big Boss. This will be Miller's revenge against Big Boss for abandoning him. But the quiet civil war within Cypher will eventually put the Patriots on one side and the forces aligned to Big Boss on the other, with Ocelot secretly working both sides as Big Boss's triple agent. If you really listen to Skullface's speech, building the Patriots was Zero's attempt to replace Big Boss. This is why the Venom Snake ruse was concocted by Zero in the first place, to serve as an instrument, a tool to shape the public mind. 
to generate wealth and to gain political clout, all things that he initially intended to use the real Big Boss to do. Separately, Big Boss and Ocelot used the Venom Snake Ruse to grow what will become their rebellion against Zero's world order when the time is right, their rival system of Outer Heaven. This sets the stage for conflict between each generation of snakes. First Venom vs. Big Boss, then Big Boss vs. Solid Snake, then Solid Snake vs. Liquid. As the boss warned back in Selenio Yarsk, there's only room for one boss. That's part of why the real Big Boss is laying low throughout the events of this game, and will continue to do so until his phantom is eradicated by Solid Snake, allowing, in turn, the real Big Boss to come back. Destroying MSF and exposing its nuke to the world was the first step towards making the future war economy that we encounter in MGS4 a reality. We learn in both tapes and overheard conversations that Big Boss's legend has all but single-handedly sparked the shift towards private forces and, in turn, towards a demand for nuclear proliferation as a means of deterring ethnic conflict. Though the original plan by Skullface which involved wiping out the English language, never comes to complete fruition, his actions do seem to lay the foundation for the norms the Patriot AIs, free from any one person's power to control, will reinvent the global order with as the war economy. The first important event in the timeline of the 20th century, as far as the Phantom Pain goes, happens in the early part of the century. The Chinese philosophers discover a relative species of Pentastomida that will bear traces of ancestry with the vocal cord parasites. At the time, they plan to develop a phonogrammic Alexia parasite to suppress the brain's ability to become literate in English. This is the first step towards what will become Skullface's plan to eradicate the English language. Skullface is born in northern Transylvania, Roughly in late 1940, he grows up in a state of endless warfare as World War II happens as a direct consequence of World War I and in turn becomes the Cold War. At a very young age, a terrible trauma burns off most of his skin, and it would have killed him if not for the philosophers who apparently kept him alive using parasite therapy. I owe you my life. My body has been burned on countless occasions, but it survives thanks to your children. That is why I trust you. Skullface has finally burned out. The world is rid of his existence at last. Was he still alive? You could say that. But you could also say he'd been dead for decades. What's that supposed to mean? Biologically speaking, it's hard to say how much was his life. Side effects from the treatment? No. The primary effect. Keeping a dying host alive as long as possible. That is the whole point. Skullface then went on to make a name for himself within the organization by conducting silent assassinations and sabotage, in mysterious cases that Ocelot hints also involved parasitic weapons. In the late 40s and early 50s, roughly around the time that Skullface is revived with parasites, the philosophers who have contrived the Cold War realize that ethnic cleansing campaigns will inevitably result once it ends. So they begin to experiment with the ultimate deterrent to ethnic cleansing, parasite strains that can kill based on culturally specific vectors. This so-called ethnic cleanser plan never fully materializes as a deterrent. By the 1950s, Skullface, working officially as a Soviet, gets revenge for his fellow Northern Transylvanians by secretly killing Joseph Stalin. Then Skullface defects to the West and falls into league with Zero. Zero uses Skullface in turn to lead a phantom organization tasked with covertly supporting Unit Fox. This unit is named XOF. After the events of Snake Eater, the organization Cypher is born, funded by the Philosopher's Legacy. Code Talker, who in the early 40s helped create the Navajo Code that was used in World War II against Japan, by the late 60s is a parasitologist who's exposed himself to multiple pathogens over many years of research. It's in the late 60s he's brought into the fold of Cypher, right around the time that Cypher is formed, by a foundation with links to ARPA. This foundation allows Code Talker to implant himself with the ends parasites, as well as studying the foundation's research material. 
from the end's parasites, Code Talker will cultivate other strains of parasites that give extraordinary abilities, including the ones used to make the skulls. 1973, Code Talker discovers Archaea, which can metabolize uranium, but he can't find funding. 1974 are the events of Peace Walker. Cypher realized that an AI couldn't be trusted to make unilateral decisions. 1975. My theory is that Zero ordered the attack on Mother Base, not Skullface. This is inductive reasoning, but it's possible that the attack on MSF by Skullface in the Caribbean was actually him still fulfilling part of XOF's mission, considering that Skullface manages to destroy MSF while also ensuring that Big Boss survives and that no trace of the true identity of the culprit is ever revealed. If Fox was zero silver bullet, XOF was the recoil when he pulled the trigger. Just like Newton's third law. While you were with Fox, Skullface was operating behind the scenes. Sometimes as your backup, Sometimes as a mole or a scout. Sometimes as your cleanup crew. Fox's tail. Making sure the mission succeeded and that you survived. Took a lot longer for you to surface than I expected, Major. I wasn't planning on coming back at all, but I had no choice. Well, after the Caribbean. My hunch was proven right. You wouldn't believe who was behind it. Oh, I have an idea. How did you respond? Immediate disinformation campaign. Most bought into the story, but not everyone. It was quite an incident, after all. I couldn't cover everything. But I did hide the fact that Snake survived. But if this is true, it seems that what Zero never understood before it was too late was that Skullface only attacked MSF for Cypher to lure Zero into a false sense of security. First Big Boss, then Zero. Liberation is at hand. But Skullface won't attack Zero for at least a year. In the meantime, though it's unknown whether this next event occurred before or after the events of Ground Zeroes, Cypher discover an ancient cadaver in a permafrost region and isolate from it the DNA coding of the ancient vocal cord parasites. Using the relative strain that was first discovered by the Chinese philosopher, as I mentioned before, Paramedic, aka Dr. Clark, revives the vocal cord parasites, Jurassic Park style, using reverse evolution. After the attack on MSF, Skullface, officially as punishment, is reassigned to Africa. And it seems to be here that he makes his deal with Code Talker. I mentioned already that Code Talker had discovered Archaea that can metabolize uranium. But nobody was willing to invest with no prospect of a return. The ground beneath the Navajo Nation was rich with uranium ore. The Blagana government set up mine after mine, and many of the Diné worked them, never informed of any danger. That pain lives on to this day. I began thinking that minority languages needed some sort of deterrent against dominant languages. In order that they, that their peoples and cultures would survive, it was then that I came across literature at the Foundation claiming that man acquired language thanks to a type of parasite, one that distinguishes between languages as a precursor to reproduction. If I could just resurrect it, make it more pathogenic, I would have my deterrent against English. And that's when Skullface showed up. Correct. I can save you and your people. We share the same will. That is what he said to me. And I believed him. Black Anna forced me to abandon my uranium cleanup work and focus on nuclear weapons. And he held all the Diné hostage. What he offered me was not just assistance with my metallic archaea research. He told me the vocal cord parasites really existed. And not only did they exist, 
They had already been brought back to life in the modern age. I was tasked with modifying the resurrected parasites. And part of Skullface and Kotaker's bargain is for Kotaker to make the vocal cord parasites that have just been revived lethal and make them mate in monogamous pairs, copulating within a single host only when exposed to specific pronunciations continuously over an extended time. He orders Kotaker to do this for all languages except English. If the cleanser parasites were to be a deterrent against ethnic conflict, they had to distinguish between groups using means other than pure language. The current parasites mainly rely on droplet transmission. It would take extensive time to alter the transmission route. I eventually learned that the ethnic cleansers project had been shut down. It was Skullface who put it back into operation. But despite that, he told me to forget about the transmission route and just focus on language identification. In that sense, they are imperfect as ethnic cleansers. But for his purposes, they are good enough. His objective was not to exterminate any one ethnic group but to render the world's lingua franca, English, inert. Using a perfect replica of a sentimental memento that the boss died with still in her possession, it's in 1976 that Skullface uses a parasite cultivated by Kotaker to give Zero brain damage, forcing control over Cypher to pass to the AIs. Meanwhile, Skullface retains a large degree of power thanks to Zero having built a strictly need-to-know information system. Using Zero's networks of financial shells, proxies, and cutouts, Skullface was able to covertly fund the Vocal Cord Parasite project. Also at this time, Eli, who was a clone of Big Boss created in 1972, is moved to Britain, and the ATGC program for the cloning is shut down. Seventy-seven. Zero escapes from anyone's ability to find, using, it seems, the AI JD to do so. The way to JD was opened, but only through the physical manifestation of GW. That's when we finally learned the location of this man, Zero. Now the only record of his location lies within the cipher AI that was at the heart of the escape plan. And that's closed off, with its data sealed away in a secret location. I'll be somewhere even you can't find me. A tombstone chiseled into the code of a machine. That is all I leave to mark my existence. He visits Big Boss in Cyprus, then disappears. Eli, meanwhile, is moved to South Africa. 1979. Skullface, meanwhile, in South Africa, uses Israel and South Africa to test the enrichment Archaea nuke in the Indian Ocean. The Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, mistaking it for another Hungarian revolution scenario that needs to be brutally crushed. Detente ends with this invasion and the Cold War seems to be back on, just as Skullface plans. 1980, it's in this year that Hal, the son of Strangelove and Huey, is born. Between late 1979 to 1980, Strangelove, under orders by Cypher, has the mammal pod extracted from Nicaragua and modifies it to create the system, the framework for a united world. This will be called the Patriots, and it's a chain of neural network AIs built around the one that's currently in existence, JD. When Huey used HAL as a test pilot for Soholanthropus, he and Dr. Strangelove had a falling out. She sent HAL to live in America, and out of revenge, Huey apparently trapped Strangelove inside the AI pod, where she suffocated and died, and Cypher go in a different direction with the project, presumably meaning no longer modeling it as completely on Joy's thought patterns, since Strangelove was apparently yet again trying to bring Joy's phantom back. But as the sort of complement to Skullface, Strangelove's will will outlive her embedded inside the system. That will likely refers to the egg so to speak, that Sunny, Strangelove's granddaughter, will crack in MGS4. In other words, this is an explanation for how Sunny figures out how to reprogram the Fox Alive computer virus to keep civilization partially intact, even after the Patriots are gone. 
I signed up for Zero's plan. Even now that he's halfway to dead, his plan lives on, leeching away at the wall. And it took your strength to make it happen. In using you, I put the world in his palm. Once and for all. They made me simulate his will. So that even after the body was gone, that will would keep the world turning the way they wanted. I had no choice. They dredged Lago Cosi Bolka, pulled up your phantom, forced me to revive and modify you. He'll never break your will. The will to make this world the way you saw it could be. Buried code, just to be sure. Inside of you, there is an egg. And when someone finds it, when they crack it, there'll be nothing left to stop you. The world you envisioned will become a reality. What's crucial to remember is that the Patriots can't make decisions unilaterally. They can only act by studying data and processing it, shaping how reality will be perceived as that data is passed on to the public mind. To do this, they'll need the nanomachines and gene therapies that will be derived, it seems, from the parasite research by Code Talker. You are correct. Most of my body is covered with parasites. I supply them with water and in return I receive sugars they produce when exposed to light. But the norms that the Patriots will generate will derive from a world, a context, provided by Skullface during his brief time in power, or at the very least, a world that Skullface sets into motion. I think the influence of the Patriots on MGSV is more present than people realize. If you think about phrases from MGS4 that describe the Patriots, like endless iterations of the same oppressive system, and shapeless, formless. They kind of explain, I think, why the bosses in MGSV are sort of interchangeable and basically faceless and anonymous non-entities. Much to some extent, like the actual character we only know as Medic, who goes on to become Venom Snake. He could be anyone, and in a way he is no one. A blank empty zero. Let's wrap up this section by looking at some suggestions the game seemingly implants in us while playing it. A. Venom Snake and the Devil's Test Subjects Victims of the experiments. They were implanted without my knowledge. Man, had I known, there is nothing I could have done. Are the MIA Intel team members buried there too? Code Talker and Kaz will tell you if you walk past these unmarked graves that they contain the missing members of the Intel team. But while Code Talker says they were implanted with the pathogen, the Intel team agent in the last mission said that they died as human shields getting him out. So which is it? Based on what we've seen, if these burials were really of experiment subjects by Skullface, it seems more likely they would have been burned rather than buried, like all the rest. Our other men got me out of that mansion, acted as human shields, told me, get this intel to the boss. The reason Skullface called me Code Talker was because I also am responsible for coding language into the vocal cord parasites. I am the same as those young warriors, used for a cipher's sake. I must never forget that. We've been busy over the last nine years. 
His altered state of consciousness has helped us implant powerful suggestions through induced hypnagogia. He has experienced all your missions on record and shares all your knowledge and experience to make him believe that he is the one true big boss. A cassette player. What's it playing? Are they brainwashing him? Could it be that Code Talker and his parasites are somehow wrapped up in the mind control experiment that gives us Punish Venom Snake, which we learn about at the end of the game? Or is this merely Snake feeling guilt and terror as he's remembering these events about what's to come, when by slaughtering members of Diamond Dogs, he'll use them as human shields, just as Big Boss is using him? It's impossible to say for sure. While we're on this subject of Code Talker's possible involvement, I've always wondered if the shrapnel in Snake's head is actually shrapnel at all. After all, it grows the more demon points you rack up, which implies it's more of a living thing than a chunk of metal. If we look at the rock-like archaea used by the skulls and Sahelanthropus, it looks kind of similar to V-Shrapnel. Could there be some relation? If Code Talker was involved at an early stage in this process, it could also explain Miller's eyes, which look like Code Talkers. As well as the way that Miller can apparently see or sense quiet in ways that normal humans can't with their naked eye. either. The parasites also act as my eyes. When we visit the Devil's House during Voices, we're reminded of the hospital massacre for the first time. All of the test subjects almost seem like dream-like copies of Venom Snake, and how they're plugged up to the same kind of IV bags. Their head straps resemble bandanas, and they're being used to breed some invisible alien presence within themselves. All of these aspects could metaphorically be nods to Venom Snake himself, who seems to have been reawakened with a similarly coded song on tape, Midge Ur's cover of The Man Who Sold the World. It's not a radio broadcast, it's music, which is something that we see again, or at least it seems, during Shining Lights. But whether in the prologue this awakening by tape is done using literal parasites that have been put in Venom Snake or merely through hypnagogic dream therapy is impossible to say for sure. Notably, however, there is what Skullface says that seems to imply a commonality with the test subjects in the Devil's House. You. Burn with the rest of them. <laughs> B. Code Talker's Children and Cypher I've already mentioned that I have my suspicions about Code Talker, but while making this video, it hit me. Why assume that Code Talker and his creations, what he calls his children, necessarily go hand in hand? Obviously, Code Talker has ties to Cypher, but he also has ties to Skullface. Skullface stole his children from him for Skullface's own dark designs. If Skullface can do that, why not Cypher? Why not the Patriots? In short, I don't think Code Talker's willing and direct involvement is necessary to explain how much future gear created by the Patriots seemingly resembles his handiwork. But I can't rule out his involvement either. And finally, C, the possibility of a totally unreliable narrator. All we have to go on for any of the events in this game are the memories of a man who's lost his mind. We see for ourselves Venom Snake can remember the exact same events totally differently, if we compare the differences between the prologue and the last episode, we also see that he can hallucinate not only events like taking off his mask in the research facility, which would have killed him if it really took place, but also hallucinate entire people, places, and conversations. Take pause, for example. So why then, in our Ahab-like hunt for truth, do we ignore the consequences that these revelations suggest for our search? We can't not only not trust anyone in our organization, 
What if she's a spy? What if I'm a spy? Are you? Go on all day. On a much deeper level, we can't even trust ourselves. And that really is the true beauty of this game. It's been a long and maze-like road that we've traveled together, only to find that road forms a closed loop. We can keep replaying The Phantom Pain for years, and due to the brilliant open-ended way that it's written, never be any closer to the absolute truth. Analyzing why this is so, what it has to say about the very concept of absolute truth, along with talking about the wider themes, symbols, and literary allusions throughout this game, we'll all have to wait. I submit MGSV is itself a kind of language, one that cannot be readily translated or understood outside itself. So past a certain point, answering anything precisely and concretely isn't only impossible, it's missing the point. As Ocelot says, words are what keep a world, any world, alive. Thanks to you, I've left my mark. You have too. You've written your own history. You're your own man. I'm Big Boss. And you are too. No. He's the two of us together. Where we are today, we built it. This story, this legend, it's ours. We can change the world and with it the future. I am you and you are me. Carry that with you wherever you go. Thank you, my friend. From here on out, you're a big boss. Until next time, boss.